you know that's the weakness in their case. Right, but do you think that that will go over with the jury, that they will in, is that there's any percentage chance that they will convict without knowing about Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it happens. It happens all the time, especially when you have such a sympathetic victim. This wife of 25 years, seems to be the salt of the earth. They were the perfect couple, of course, from everything we've heard, 25 years of, uh, of, of bliss. So that's a little bit confusing for folks looking for that motive, but they, wanted, they want justice for the victim. And as they're sitting there weighing whether there's a motive, whether there's not, whether the elements of the crime have been met, in the back of their minds, is, uh, it's really what else could have happened? You know, mm -hmm. Who else could have done this? And I don't know that the defense has come up with, you know, they don't have to prove somebody else did it, but it would help if they gave the jury something else to cling to. And this story about the bird pipe uh, is just so bizarre. And is it possible? Oh, I guess anything's possible, but it is so improbable. So it's interesting because you're saying psychologically, a jury like this is probably grappling with wanting to do justice for the victim, but at the same time questioning, well, why would he do this? And because there is no really substantial alternative explanation, which do you think will win? Boy, I wish if I knew that, Amy, I could make <laughs> then a you fortune. Could predict and, the outcome yes, here. Uh, yes, and that's I what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, and there, uh, you know, when you weigh all of the the the, uh, the presentation that we've seen over the last few days, you have to come down one side or the other. For me, there are two huge problems for the defense that would lead to a conviction. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, their only hope, the defense's only hope, is to turn one person. I mean, they don't have to get 12 people to find reasonable doubt. They have to have one person that just can't buy the, the, the prosecution story. Here are the two things that I think are the biggest problem. One is a bit of a surprise, and one is expected. The biggest surprise, I think, is that the defense expert was horrible. <laughs> yes. Just horrible. Yes. You know, when you interview, consult with an expert, the goal is to find somebody that, I don't know, supports your case <laughs> right. and your client, not just a warm body to throw up there that might be malleable, that might end up at the end of the day, sounding kind of like a prosecution expert. But at this, but by the same token, the prosecution expert admitted that he had no experience with glass analysis. True. This is probably one of the unusual cases where expert testimony may mean nothing mm -hmm. or far less than it normally does. But isn't that a big problem, Michael? Because here, this case is premised on a battle of the experts. It is, and that's why I think this is a surprising element in, in what I think are the two biggest failings for the defense in this case. You don't have an expert to support your case, then you pay them the consulting fee and you say, see you later. Right. Yeah, so that's don't number let the door weakness hit you. number one. Number two is more expected, the defendant testifying. Um, you know, very seldom does the defendant testifying help his position. And I wonder sometimes when you come to that decision, okay, we're going to put the defendant on the stand, and obviously the defendant has an absolute right to testify, even if his uh, counsel says, no, it's a bad idea. So in this case, was it, was it the, the defendant overpowering his attorneys to convince them it was worth the effort? Or was it the attorney saying, oh, what the hell? You know, this is a mess. How bad could it be? But also, by the same token, just to play devil's advocate, doesn't it also show the jury that maybe he doesn't have anything to hide? I think that's one of the reasons he, as a defendant, would certainly want to testify. Whether he does or doesn't have something to hide, what he thinks is, I can convince somebody I don't have anything to hide, that I'm just, you know, I'm just a Wisconsin guy, you know, just trying to, you know, flip a house, fix a windshield, you know, live Go my life Go to the annual out. Cranberry Festival I'm with going, my wife. I'm going to that, as <laughs> I am now fired up about the festival. Um, so, yeah, just, you're... Just I, drive carefully on this highway. Apparently, some of the side roads can be treacherous. Yes. Yeah, so, so I think that, yeah, it's important that, uh, that, that the defendant take the stand if he thinks he can convince the jury that he's perfectly innocent. It's just so dangerous. And in his particular case, I don't think Todd really uh, helped himself. Why? Why? What was harmful? Well, I think he's caught in so many different contradictions about what he said in a police interview versus what he says on the stand. And some of the questions that the prosecutor, especially on cross-examination, were so pointed. I mean, cross-exam is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, you get in that rhythm. You know, the rhythm. Amy, you know, isn't it true you wore a green dress today? Yes. You know, isn't uh, it true you have brownish hair? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Isn't it true that you beat your dog? <laughs> I mean, you get into this rhythm that you're just yeah. starting to answer, you know, in the way the prosecutor wants, whether you want to or not. There was one question where uh, the prosecutor said, it's difficult to make up facts. Now, you can't answer that question, yes or no, without looking bad. Right. It's a trick question. It, I mean, n no, it's not difficult <laughs> to make up facts. Or, or I mean, yes, and if you try is. to expand upon your explanation, you're going to be told to answer yes or and, no. And so, I, obviously, the prosecution did a great job on cross, but I, I don't think that 
that, uh, that the defendant helped himself, even when he was just telling his story. It just has too many holes in it, and it starts to sound ridiculous. If you look at things like the, 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 uh, the uh, injuries to his wrists, mm -hmm. I mean, to his knuckles. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like, you know, Rocky after beating a side of beef in uh, Rocky One. You know, it, they're just bloodied, and you can't really explain that away with, I tried to stop the, you know, burb pipe from flying through the windshield, and I threw at least one but hand up against the window. But couldn't those have been scratches from glass? If you're pulling a pipe out of a shattered windshield, if you are dragging your wife out of a car and there's glass all over the place, could it be explained that way? Anything is possible. It could be. But the way he described his attempt to stop the, the bird or the pipe from hitting the windshield, mm -hmm didn't sound believable and it didn't sound like you would need both hands to do that. So would it have been better for him to just not have explained it at all, similar to what he did in the interrogation? Because also when you're saying that him taking the stand maybe wasn't such a good idea in retrospect, I'm thinking, well, we heard from him already. Do you think he sounded very similar to what we heard in the interrogation? Or do you think he sounded more, you know, roundabout he and more confused? He definitely sounded more um, prepared. Even when confronted with contradictions, he came up with you know some sort of reason for the contradiction. Either he was disheveled because of the moment yeah. and how recent it was to the event, and his wife was dying, and he was so emotionally uh, overwrought that, mm -hmm. that he wasn't thinking clearly. And now, having had time to reflect, here's what, what really happened. So I think he came across all right in the sense of his presentation. But over-explaining could also be a bad well, thing. Well, here's so what, what happens. we saw in the interrogation is he didn't have many explanations, and that was actually convincing to some people who've been on It makes this sense network. if you think about what's going on in that short period trauma, of time. And right. it's, that's, and, the, you know, that's the defense. A loved one is, is, is injured, you're trying to help, you feel maybe you caused it, and I, what do mm -hmm. I do? That it, does make perfect traumatic, sense. It's very traumatic, But I think when, sometimes when folks uh, get creative, right. you know, they get over-creative, mm -hmm. instead of sticking to just the facts. You know what they say, the, you know, the truth never changes. Mm -hmm. It's those lies that waffle from one contradiction to the next. And whether it's a function of his being kind of out of sorts when he was first talked to and then more, more prepared at a trial, or some other reason, a, a contradiction is a contradiction that doesn't easily get explained away. You say that the truth doesn't change, but memories do change sometimes, oh, sure. right? And that may not be because a person's intentionally lying. That just may be because there's been distance between the event and the testimony. And maybe at the time of the event, the circumstances were such that a person doesn't entirely remember. As time passes, they're thinking about it. They think maybe it happened that way. So it's really not an exact science, is it? Oh, of course not. And when you got human beings, mm -hmm. human beings involved, Amy, it's uh, it, uh, there's going to be a lot of that factor that isn't clean, clear-cut, obviously. And the reason why I ask is because I, I want to know, is a lot of the prosecution's theory just speculative? I mean, they're saying, well, you know, just because his friends and family who knew him and his wife so well never saw them fight, that doesn't mean that there wasn't things you never know what goes on behind it's, closed it's, doors. It's yes, interesting. That's a true statement, but that doesn't mean that he's lying. That means that they're speculating. It's almost like watching an episode of Seinfeld. They are reflecting upon what goes on normally, what, what the common occurrence is among human beings, doesn't mean that the things that went on in his life match up with that. It's like the prosecution is saying, look, we've proven our case because we've proven this, 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 and this happened. But more importantly, without saying this, of course, mm -hmm. what do you got? You know, yeah. prove that it was something else, which is totally wrong. The defendant doesn't have to prove it was something else. But the prosecution is relying to some degree on people saying, what else could possibly be the explanation for this crime? Yeah, but it seems like they are trying to fit it into their theory. And I guess that's part of the defense's um, rebuttal here is that you know, the prosecution, the law enforcement, they approach this case with their idea in mind that this is how everything unfolded and that he is guilty of a crime. Right, and here's how all those things fit into our theory. Exactly, like little puzzle pieces. Rather than being open-minded and putting as much effort into an investigation of well, could a pipe really have hit his car? And they're saying, you know, the reason that the prosecution didn't do that is because they're saying, well, it's just so out of the realm of possibility. It's just so unusual. So unusual that he would have a great relationship with his wife and never fight for 25 years. So unusual that a pipe would fly off of a truck and hit him. So unusual that Barb wouldn't go to work on time. Too many unusuals equals murder? Yeah, no, I, I, they're asking the jury to take a leap. There is no doubt about it. And so that's why we're back to that original premise of, okay, can they overcome some of those weaknesses in the prosecution's case and find this guy guilty of first-degree murder? Yeah. Uh, I mean, because they're, they're suggesting that it wasn't just um, 
maybe a heat of passion. It was planned somehow. You yeah. Know, it, it goes beyond just, you know, maybe an argument in the car that spiraled, spiraled out of control. Now, they're, they're making it sound like he specifically left the road where he did, drove further than he needed after the pipe strike. Uh, because it was to create sort of a, uh, an isolation, that he had planned that ahead of time, that it would give him time to be with his, uh, his wife alone, where nobody's going to see what he's got, got planned. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the judge has just taken the bench again in the Ken Tamar trial, so we're going to go straight to the courtroom.